Hello, my fellow comic book collectors. It's Alan, the Comic Collector Geek, and this is the Wednesday video where I answer your questions. Every week, uh, people ask me questions in the comments below, <laughs> and then the following week, I answer those questions. Um, this one's going to be a pretty cool video. Um, there's some pretty great questions. I'm going to show some classic Silver Age covers and some of my oldest comics, um, and we'll get right into it. Uh, first question is um, from Richard Lassira, uh, Lassira. Um Wonder when newsstand distribution actually stopped. What I'm talking about is the retail venues which were able to return books if not sold. I know there was a span of time when the UC, uh, UPC comics were rarer than direct market, but were any UPC comics actually distributed directly to comic shops along with non-UCP <laughs> UCP, uh, uh, PC uh, direct market books? Has it always been stated that a 9 to 8 newsstand books are hard? It has been always been stated that 9.8 newsstand books are harder to find because they're of the rougher handling. That is true, yes. Okay, so let me get into some of the things you had right, <laughs> some of the things you had wrong in what you said. Um, the newsstand uh, is still available. You can still get newsstand books. Um, Walmart is actually a frequent source of newsstand books. You can still buy from Walmart newsstand uh, many books, comics, if you want. Uh, so newsstand, is there's still newsstands out there and they still supply comics. So... Uh, that is where newsstand, that 1% of all <laughs> current distribution of comics is still to newsstands. It's a small percentage, but it does exist. Um, now, you can actually still, to this day, if, you, if the retailer at a newsstand doesn't uh, sell the book, they can still return it and get their money back. So, <laughs> it still exists. Um... Uh, most comic stores, uh, actually all comic stores, uh, do not get newsstand editions. They get the direct editions that are designed for the, the comic book retailers. Um, so that's generally <laughs> the way it works. Um, but majority of comics are sold through comic book stores. Therefore, the lion's share, like 99%, are, are direct books. Um, it's just the way it is now. Um, as I said, with with the the change of uh, the market space over the last uh, 30 years, 30, 40 years, um, people have just moved away from, uh, dr you know, the newsstands into more of the direct market. And it just, it's one of those things. It could change. Uh, you know, newsstands could start trying to bring more comics back in. But I don't see it happening, actually. Um, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, next question comes from Mr. E, the Low Grade King. Um, what is the oldest comic book you have? Um, well, comic book, that's a very uh, uh, loaded question. <laughs> but um, I'm going to actually show comic format books. Uh, because... Once you get into the concept of comic book, you can actually go back as far as uh, the early 19th century, or early um, 20th century, I should say, uh, where um, there was magazine w magazines that had comics in them, uh, and there was also uh, like books which were hardcover books with comics in them. Um, now, most people, when they say comics, they refer to the comic size, the standard comic size books. And I'll, I'll show you my two earliest ones. Uh, so we have uh, The Funnies, <laughs> number one. Uh, this is actually a pretty cool book. Um, this is from 1936. It's Dell Publishing. Um, it is the first appearance of Captain Easy, Alley Oop, Mud and Jeff, and Tailspin Tommy. So that's my first. Uh, these would be considered Platinum Age books because they're prior to the, um, the Golden Age. And the next one is Tip Top Comics number one. And 
this has got a whole bunch of first appearances in it. This is from 1936 as well, but it's a little earlier. It is from uh, April of 1936, and it has the first appearance of Tarzan, Little Abner, uh, Fritzy Ritz, Ellie Cinders, and uh, Captain and the Kids. So just a bunch of cool characters make their first appearance in this book. And it's a, a very early comic. I mean, it's maybe a few years, like a year earlier <laughs> that the first comic books were coming out. So a very early comic. So those are my two earliest comics in the standard comic format. Okay, the next question. Hope you enjoyed those. Um, next question is from K. Munin. In your opinion, what could have been done to avoid the comic book crash of the 90s? Do you think the 90s comics will be one day sought after? Okay, so there was a bunch of things that happened during the 90s that... Um, that who is to really blame for the crash is it's hard to say um so one of the things that happened was you it, it became very easy to set up a comic shop uh before you had to actually order a whole bunch of books in order to have the status where you're allowed to sell comics the rules changed that basically made it easier for people to become distribute like uh to become retailers for comics and um what happened was you got a whole bunch of people that didn't really know uh, anything about business that entered the market and you got like thousands of comic shops popping up across north america in a very short time period like within a few years it was like thousands everybody that loved comics were like hey i could set up my own shop that's a dream for most comic collectors right well that is all good <laughs> if they have a business sense. A lot of them didn't have the business sense. And a couple other mistakes that they made was um, they would, in order to, um, you know, uh, in order to sort of be a shop, you actually had, they had to order a certain amount of books. And um, that would mean that they would have this huge, like, stack of books that they might not even be able to sell and a lot of the time they'd over order on certain books because they didn't really have the business sense <laughs> in terms of how well these books would sell and you know at first it worked fine because what was happening was you you had the hype of the 90s uh where collectors were buying like 10 copies of a book because it was their retirement right it was like like death of superman i gotta buy 10 copies of it or 100 copies of it uh, I've seen people buy a whole long box of a particular key, like X-Men 1, Spider-Man 1, um, thinking that those books would become super valuable in the future. And because of that, you got two problems <laughs> that are created. One is the, the these retailers that are inexperienced, and you got comic collectors that are overly hyped up, and, you know, they're, and a lot of newbie collectors as well that didn't really understand the whole space they thought oh i can become a millionaire because i bought x-men one for a dollar or <laughs> two dollars and i'm going to sell it for a ten thousand in the future that was the kind of two problems and then you had a third problem which was the actual marvel and dc and all those companies and their financial issues and their problems now to solve those problems is quite hard um and I'm, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm a, a business owner. I, I kind of believe in the capitalist model. And one of the things that people don't understand about the capitalist model is this concept of creative destruction. <laughs> and it really does apply to the comic book market. So the way creative destruction works is um, a good example is actually not comics, but fidget spinners. Okay. And Fidget spinners were the toy of the century, I guess, <laughs> of the, this century, uh, where um, originally when they came out, they were like 30 bucks. It was like really expensive to buy a fidget spinner. And kids loved them. They, they were like, and there were like a whole bunch of different designs. And what happened was a whole bunch of companies came in on that trend. And uh, when they, you know, they were thinking, oh, I can sell these for 30 bucks. But then you had a whole bunch of companies coming in 
and um, all of a sudden they couldn't sell it for 30 bucks anymore because there was just too many fidget spinners out there. So what they did is try to modify the spin, uh, fidget spinners to have like different designs and make them collectible. That only goes so far. Um, you know, as more and more uh, people come into the market, well, after a while, uh, the prices have to drop <laughs> because there's just too much supply, not, if, not enough demand. And what ended up happening is I, you could buy, at the end of the whole fidget spinner craze, you could buy a fidget spinner for about a dollar. Sometimes I've even seen them for 50 cents. So they really dropped in value. And that's a good thing. You know, like that's the cool thing about capitalism. You know, you just let it kind of ride and then it'll, the price will actually become more affordable, more accessible for everyone. Um, however, those companies all of a sudden couldn't make a profit when out of business. A lot of businesses came and go, okay? But the ones that stayed, the ones that remained, and just the same with the comic shops, the ones that remained were stronger. They had that experience of what works and what doesn't. <laughs> and they knew um, uh, how to set their pricing so that they could stay in business. And they knew how to adapt to, uh, you know, flood of market and changes in the market. So you get stronger businesses as, as a result. So where most people think, oh, the comic crash of the 90s was devastating, and it was for some, it's actually a good thing. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you get stronger companies and you get smarter collectors. And the ones that stayed with the hobby were, they benefited because they were able to pick up uh, some books that were now on the market for cheap. <laughs> um, like I remember you could pick up Silver Age and Golden Age really cheaply because comic shops were going out of business and they just were selling fire sale uh, their comics. So in a way it was a good time for collectors and for the shops that um, remained, they were also picking up those same other stores collections and consolidating and making their collections better. So overall the crash had positive effects uh it might not have felt like it at the time but overall it made the 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 hobby stronger uh you know got rid of the speculators and it, this this will this cycle will happen again we're gonna see it again we saw it after covid the same thing you got all these people speculating and they got the prices going up like insane um i was warning people <laughs> you know the prices don't make any sense you know it's gonna crash um because I had that experience of the 90s. I, I've seen it play out before. And you just, you got to kind of understand that. And, you know, savvy collectors won't make those same mistakes. You know, burn me once, but not twice. <laughs> um, so the point is, it does make stronger collectors in the future. So whether, uh, uh, what could have been done to avoid it? Nothing. Because it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, but it does make the hobby stronger. Uh, your second part of your question is the 90s books themselves. Now, they were massively printed and they were massively kept in pristine collections. Um, really, the value is never going to be um, like the same as like a Golden Age book, which is ultra rare. Um, but there will be collectors that will want those books and they'll want them in pristine collect. You know, there will be still people that want that X-Men one <laughs> in a nine eight and um, they'll pay like a hundred dollars for it or something like that. Um, so there is, there is going to be that demand for those books. And there is a, sort of a nostalgia to the nineties style. They're, they're interesting in their own right. Um, you know, they, they were tacky. They were, they were over the top and, there is a bit of charm to all that. So um, I do believe that uh, people will gravitate to those books in the future. And or if they aren't already, I mean, there's there, there are collectors of that stuff. So, you know, they might not be, you know, expensive books, but that's actually a good thing, too, in a way, because what you're going to get is the 90s books, which are 30 years ago, if you think about it. Um, are ones that are great entry entry level books, and they are classics in their own right. So they will always be sought after, um, just not valuable, <laughs> not super expensive. Okay, so last uh, next question comes from uh, AJ Guez, 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 um, and it is: 
What techniques do you use to value low volume gold grails? So there are situations where you'll get books that are really low census counts. Like, I mean, 10 <laughs> on the census. And then you'll look at the sales and the last sale was like 10 years ago. So how do you value that kind of book? Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where there's a couple tricks that you can do. One is um, you look at the last sales. Uh, so if um, you're trying to buy a 3.0 of some random book, well, uh, you could say, okay, well, how much did the 6.0, like if, if there's a recent six or some other grade that you can say, okay, this is how much that 6.0 sold for last year. You can say, okay, maybe raise it by 10%. Um, and then you take, you divide that, whatever that new value is, let's say it's $100 or $600. Let's say $600 because that's a nice easy number. $600 uh, divided by six, a grade six. Well, then you say it's $100 a point. And then if you're buying a 3.0, then you'd say roughly $300. You know, that's one method that people use with their per point value uh, based on what any other sales that you can find in that book. Uh, and that's that's very common method to use. Now, there are some books that haven't sold <laughs> for 10 years. And you might be like, okay, well, it hasn't sold for 10 years. Um, the last value is going to be totally out to lunch. But what I do, if it hasn't sold for 10 years, I take, I still go by that per point uh, method. And what I'll do is actually take the value and multiply it by uh, two. So usually things go up two times. That's, it's a really, this is really like um, ballparking it. And just to give yourself a basic, you know, evaluation of it. Um, usually about two times in 10 years. Uh, because the rate of return is around, around, it works out mathematically that way. Uh, so, um, so if books sold for $100 10 years ago, then I, I evaluate it at being $200 now. And then you can do the price per point to figure out what the book that you're looking at is worth. Um, that's one method. Another thing is you can look at comps. <laughs> so um, what, for example, uh, romance books or, um, or you know, if you're comparing a romance book it, or pre-code horror books, the quality of the cover, the, the, the artist involved, and you can look at comps to say, okay, based on this book, maybe it's not a, it's not one that's already recognized. Like any of the recognized ones that everyone knows, those ones, pretty obvious what the price is because it's very well established. But the ones that are a little bit off the radar, the way you do it is you look at comps. So you look at books within that same that same title that are of comparable level in terms of quality of art, the artists, the the quality of the cover, and you say, okay, this other book in the same title sold for this much and do the poor point thing. And it's usually pretty accurate. Um, if you look at Overstreet Guide, that's exactly what they do. They'll often say one through or three through five is worth this price. Uh, six through nine is worth this price. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, where they, they basically say that these are comparable books. And, um, that's that's a trick that you can do. Um, you can even use the Overstreet Guide as a means of evaluating books that don't have uh, frequent sales history. That's another method. I don't necessarily rely on Overstreet because usually it's a little bit out of date, but um, it does actually do a reasonable job when you have these books with very low sales volume. So there is that as well. Um, but using comps is probably the most logical way of doing it um i i often appraise books you know for other people and i figure out based on what i'm seeing like the quality of the art the, you know the comp you know similar titles and how much they sold for you can kind of figure it out after a while um so that's generally what i do so i i i, I i'm and usually i'm i err on the low side um because you don't want to be one of those people where you overpay for something so i try to err on the low side but I try to also think of what, um, like, for example, right now, pre-code horror is a bit hot. 
and I think, okay, well, maybe instead of two times that 10 year old price, maybe I'll go three times because there is that kind of price thing that's happened recently where it's, they've been sort of spiking. So there's things like that where I'll kind of price things based on all those metrics. <laughs> so I hope that helps. Um, and those are some of the techniques that I use. Um, and I get, I'm usually pretty accurate. I'm pretty good at praising books using those methods. Um, next question comes from Mark LaPuma. La Puma? Actually, part Mark La Puma. <laughs> See, I got it. Okay. Uh, great content. I have a question. I recently, recently purchased a Detective 58, a CGC 2.5 Universal. And the grader's notes do say very minor color touch on cover, minor tear seals. But the book is a universal grade. I've seen a few Golden Age books retain the blue label with similar notes, but I'm still a little confused as to why they get the universal labels. Any insight on these? Now, here's the way it works. Um, when they say very minor color touch, it could be just a dot. <laughs> and generally, um, if it's like very, like, I mean, really, really, really minor, then even though it, there is color touch, because Color touch could be like um, like somebody literally like putting an ink onto the page that is not from the comic. Obviously, there like, there there is co like a color touch happening. Um, whether it's intentional that they're trying to like you know restore the book uh, is questionable. But it's so small that it's not it's not considered restoration. Um, the same happens with glue on the cover. I've seen um, Golden Age books uh, with glue on the cover and like minor glue on spine or something like that, where those also got blue labels. Now, there are, uh, I think what CGC was doing in the past was um, it would give blue labels. Like, let's say you had a book that had like 60% of the census being restored books. Well, they didn't want it to be 100%. So sometimes what they would do is when the the restoration, like, and the, this is restoration, uh, was very, very minor. Uh, what they would do is they would say, okay, it's a blue label. We're going to denote that it has this level of minor restoration. And um, we're going to say that it's one grade or half a grade lower than the actual grade. So that, that's another thing that I've seen. I've seen that on a few books. <laughs> so um, that could be the case as well. Uh, but often if it's very, very minor restoration, um, then um, you can get away with it, <laughs> I guess, is the best way to say it. Um, that, and that's more with the older books than with the modern. If you did the same in a modern book, you might not get away with it. You probably wouldn't get away with it. Um, but usually it's a, it has to be a very, and there's probably, I think there is like within the CGC guidelines, like how minor that has to be. Like it, it has to be under a millimeter or something like that. You know, it's like, like a millimeter squared or something. You know, it's really small amount of restoration, uh, in terms of color touch. So they do have like standards where they kind of give a little bit of leniency on these books. So that'd be my insight on that. Um, next book, uh, next question comes from my good friend, actually, uh, Keston Old School, uh, comic, uh, comic books. Um, really great channel, if you ever check him out. Uh, he's a good friend. Uh, and he asked me, hi, Alan, I have a question for you. When people speak about classic covers, they typically are referring to Golden Age books. What do you consider to be classic covers of the Silver Age? Well, I got a bunch. <laughs> I brought a bunch of Silver Age classic covers. And um, a lot of the classic covers are keys. Like, it's, it's one of those things. Like, uh, And I'll show you what I mean by that uh, when I, with my very first book, actually. Um, this one. This is a classic cover. Because everybody knows it's, it's iconic. It's been homaged many, many times because it is a classic cover. It's got the monster coming through the ground. Uh, you got uh, the, your team all around it. It's just a, it's a classic cover um, for those reasons. Um, you know, I think The Simpsons did an homage to it. Uh, I've seen Disney homages to this. You know, it's 
it's it's one of those homage covers and the reason they homage it is because it's a classic cover so that's fantastic for number one and another fantastic four that uh, is considered a classic cover is this one with uh, the thing and he's just sort of standing there uh, this is, uh, I believe this is a Jack Kirby cover yeah Joe Jack Kirby's Joe Simon cover Simon. just a really you know classic cover very basic but classic uh, and then we got one more uh, Fantastic Four and then I'll show some others this is another one a very classic cover you know with the, the first meetup of um, Hulk and the thing and uh, this is uh, Fantastic Four number 12 it's a classic cover people people love this cover and, uh, then we get more. One second. Oh, I gotta grab these. Okay. Then we got um, another classic cover. Is the Iron Man number one? A lot of these, you know, number one issues had pretty classic covers, and this is one of them. So Iron Man number one. Just a classic cover. Um, another. I believe this is another. Uh, oh no, Gene Colan cover. So just a cool one. And another great classic cover, like uh, this is a really awesome one. Uh, this is Submariner number five, and it's um, uh, um, John Buscema and uh, Frank Giacona. Giacona, Codia, Coya, Coya. <laughs> I'm totally brutalizing their names, but Buscema. It's a Buscema cover. Um, yeah, this is a great classic cover amazing you know just one of those ones that people really really love uh, so uh submariner number five another one um, i don't want to just show marvel all the time it, this is uh another classic cover where you have the golden age and silver age flash meet up and this is uh flash 123 and who did the cover on this one um Carmen Infantino and Murphy Anderson cover. So just a classic, classic cover. Flash. So, the, you know, the ones that you mainly think of, like the iconic covers from the 60s, those are the ones that people will consider classic covers. This is another one. Um, you know, this is one that is most often a cover by. I mean, it's like considered to be one of the best X-Men covers. Uh, this is X-Men number 50, and it's a Stranko cover. Uh, just a really classic, um, you know, uh, Polaris cover. Just, uh, you know, the greens and the, the little bit of the crackly background, and just a classic cover. And a lot of Spider-Man covers are classic covers, and probably one of the probably the most famous uh, cover is the John Morita and Morita cover. Um, it's uh, Amazing Spider-Man number fifty. And this is just another one that's been homaged a million times. Just a classic cover where he's walking away from being Spider-Man. So that's another classic cover. I have a ton more, <laughs> a ton more to show. These are all ones I think are classic, and you can you can tell me some in the comments below what you think are classic covers. But this is one that I always loved. Uh, this is uh, Fazetta, uh, Vampirella number one, another one that's been homaged a million times. Uh, just a really great cover. You know, her standing in front of the moon, and you got the the wings of the bat, and you know, suggestive of her becoming a. The vampire right and the skull under her foot and this is a great classic cover um then another really like this is another one where like anything where people buy it based just purely on the cover <laughs> like it's not a key um those are the classic covers from the silver age and this would be definitely one of those uh, where people buy it just because it's like this awesome Silver Surfer Thor cover. I mean, it's, you know, he's on the Rainbow Bridge. It's Silver Surfer coming down at this really great angle. And 
you know, it's just the, the way that they're lined up and it's just such a classic cover. So this is Silver Surfer number four. This one that everyone, you know, kind of gravitates to because it's such a iconic cover. And probably the first classic cover of the Silver Age would be Showcase number four, Carmen Fatino cover. Um, and just, um, oh wait, yeah, cover is Joe Kubert and Carmen Infantino. Yeah, just a great one. Um, like, very iconic. Everyone knows this cover, and it's one that people, you know, kind of love. And I'm going to leave my favorite at the end. Um, then you get, like, again, the keys are the ones that generally people will know and get homaged a lot. So we got the Avengers where the, you get the team and you got the evil guy, and the, you know, Loki, you know, the bad guy, I guess. Um, you know, and that kind of, you see the back of his head and it's sort of really classic uh, team up kind of cover. So Avengers 1. And then we got one of the biggest classic covers is probably in the most iconic of the, of the Silver Age even. I would say is Amazing Fantasy 15. I'm not showing this because it's like a grail, but it is a grail. <laughs> it's like, but it is one that's just probably the most recognized cover of the Silver Age. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's a definite classic cover. It, you know, just the way it's drawn is like, you know, it, like this book, the cover of it is what made this character, made Marvel, Marvel. Uh, people saw this and were like, wow, something is, this is so cool. You know, it just had that appeal. Um, really great uh, Jack Kirby cover. And another classic one uh, is obviously uh, Th Thor's first appearance, which is uh, A Journey into Mystery 83. Um, another classic one where he's spinning Mjolnir around and taking out all the bad guys and you get the bad guys jumping down from their spaceship and stuff. Just another great one that everyone loves. Um, so these ones, you know, are sort of burned into people collectors' minds as being iconic covers. But my favorite, <laughs> my favorite classic cover from all of these um, is actually one that is fairly affordable, but is beautiful. I think it's one of the most beautiful covers of the Silver Age. Um, is Dolphin. Uh, this is Dolphin number 79, showcase number 79, the first appearance of Dolphin. So, uh, showcase 79. Just, uh, just something about it is just so beautiful. Um, just the way she goes right across the cover. Um, you know, you get her hair flowing and just really long legs and just a beautiful cover. The greens really make it pop and you know, just the, her contra the contrast of her against this green background and the bubbles floating up. It's just really, really well done. Um, so this is a, a J. Scott Pike story cover and art. It's a really great one. So those are my, my thoughts on iconic uh, or classic Silver Age comics um, covers. So next question comes from Brent, Brent Cooney. Um, what would what would be the price difference between a, a Canadian and U.S. book? I bought... Um, I recently bought a Torchy number 5 Canadian edition print. Okay, so... Uh, actually, okay, so in this question... You're kind of asking more on the golden age and like there are modern versions of the price variants and all that and the price variants generally do really well in the modern era so you know the canadian price variant is like one tenth as common as the american price variant um and usually they came out at the same time now in the golden age <laughs> um generally uh the canadian price ones uh came out a year later um Often um, Superior, you'll get, like, often they'd be printed by Superior or Bell Features, and they usually came out later. Sometimes they came out around the same time, but usually a little bit later. 
um, and that's just because of the distribution rights that that um, that happened during uh, the war and uh, comics uh, during the golden age were not allowed to be um, imported into Canada. There was trade embargoes, and that's why we got the Canadian whites and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what would happen is uh, the books would get reprinted in Canada. Um, sometimes they get simultaneous, about the same time, like a month or so apart, but often they were reprinted in Canada. Collectors know that. <laughs> and generally what happens is because they, they were reprinted in Canada, they don't quite get the value of the American counterparts, even though they're much, much rarer. Like, they're way rarer. Um, you know, you'll see census counts, like, being, like, like a tenth, again, um, of their American counterparts. So, you know, like, some books, maybe a couple on the census or, or one on the census. Very low census counts for these Canadian books, which would make you think they should be more valuable. But often I've seen them get about 20% less. <laughs> So it depends on the seller. Some sellers will kind of mark them up uh, because they are rarer. But for the most part, I've seen them go for a little bit less. Usually, you know, as I said, 20% less. And that's just because they have that reprint um, association with them. Um, you know, that could change. Uh, that definitely, like, I, th I think that there is a market for that where you could pick up uh, Canadian books a little bit on the cheap, like a little bit cheaper. And um, in the future, when the scarcity of those books gets more understood by collectors, uh, they might be a really good investment. Um, so I'd be very happy to have a Torchy number no. 5 Canadian edition. Um, another thing that you would have, just so you know, um, and I've seen this where Ryan from Automatic Comics actually showed these. Um, he bought a, a collection of Planet Comics Canadian editions. And what you had is, um, like, it was like, I think he bought one through five or something like that, where it was like, um, like Planet Comics one through five, but Canadian editions. So, and it worked out that number five, number one was actually number 60, you know, of Planet Comics. It was, it was much later in the series. And that, that was another thing that would happen where you'd get, um, the Canadian editions being a different numbering system or, still reprints of the American editions or Simo prints of the American editions. And that was another thing. Um, often, you know, again, it goes back to scarcity and how um, the market interprets that scarcity. Often those books go for less than the American counterparts. It just is what it is. Um, now, I have seen them go for more. So take everything I say with a grain of salt, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because... Uh, it, again, it really depends on how the the books are marketed. <laughs> it's, it's like because it isn't established, and there there's such low census counts that there's not that um, established market where you can say, oh, okay, these Canadian prices are consistently 100% higher, or 10% higher, you know. Um, but what I've seen generally is you can get a deal on the Canadian editions because they are. Canadian editions it could change it could definitely change it's it's just a thing so hopefully that helps um uh next question <laughs> last question actually comes from uh Steve Driscoll uh what do you think do you think comic books are more costly on the east west coast than the midwest okay um Hmm. That's kind of one of those weird questions, um, because um, it depends on the marketplace. So when you, when we think of comics, um, we think of where can we buy comics. So uh, there's really only two methods to buy comics, <laughs> really. Actually, three three methods I'll say. One is you buy from online, so eBay, Heritage Auctions, you know, some kind of my comic shop all those sources. So that's one source. Second source is um, you buy comics in um, your local comic book shop, okay? And that's those, so th in those two locations, because it's online, everybody gets the same price. Uh, LCSs 
generally will have all the sim will have similar prices depending on the markets. Um, and I, I, I have experience where certain markets will charge more because it's just lack of access. Um, I saw that a lot in when I was growing up in the 90s um, where you know they they kind of priced in the fact that it was locally scarce. You get that kind of weird thing. Um, you know that that was a thing. Uh, but then there's a third resource for where you can get comics. And if you watch Lunch Money Comics, <laughs> a little shout out to him too. Um, he he's in the he's in the East Coast or Eastern New England area. And he will go to like flea markets and local antique shops and like, you know, hunt around for comics. And because there's actually a huge amount of inventory uh, in there where, you know, a lot of the printing was done in the East Coast, um, you can actually find collections relatively easy and you can get pretty good pricing on those books because there's just more supply than maybe the Midwest would have, or uh, you know, uh, or for example, Canada versus the United States. Um, so you can see that kind of regional effect within the the flea market space. Um, also, what I've seen in being in Ottawa um, is you get different interests within the local markets. So when I went to the last uh, Comic Con, which was just on the weekend. <laughs> I was really shocked because um, they would value Silver Age and Modern and Bronze very, very high. <laughs> like they would put a lot more value on those books than I would. Um, I had sort of a lower opinion of those books. Um, and they would put a very, they had a low opinion of Golden Age books. So Golden Age books were pretty affordable. More modern stuff was not so affordable, which is really weird. It's like the opposite of wherever, everywhere else. And it's just what they're interested in. The local market is, that's what they're interested in. They don't understand Golden Age or don't have the appreciation that I do for Golden Age. So um, you do see those kind of weird regional effects. Um, whereas in Toronto, it's the very opposite. Like uh, Toronto Golden Age books were very sought after and way overpriced. And um, so you get these weird regional effects where the local market desires a certain type of book um, and I imagine that plays out in the U.S. as well where you get different local interests and um, you know that could impact how the books are priced um, also the availability of books really does play a role in in any pricing of the books if you're in more of a middle of the nowhere place um, where they don't have any interest in comics even you can get books maybe really cheaply or um, or that same small market might be like, OK, well, we don't have much. We're going to charge you an arm and a leg for the same books. <laughs> it's like it really depends. So um, it's it's hard to say, really. Um, but that's what I've experienced just in my rather, uh, you know, extensive hunting throughout uh, North America and all the shops that I've been to. That's what I've seen. Um, I was actually surprised when I was in New York um, how they priced books because they were really expensive. <laughs> they were really pricing them high. I was like, okay, okay, I see how this works. <laughs> and it could just be that, you know, there's uh, more people and they can charge more because, uh, and they have to also pay more for the, the space that they're renting. So you can see that as well where, um, you know, shops will charge more because they their their expenses are higher so that's another thing so hopefully that helps i don't know that uh, you know it's just my experience but um you know i'd love to hear what other people have experienced in terms of their hunting in the wild for comics and the prices that they've seen um that's it for this this uh, q a but if you have a question that you want answered put it in the comments below and I'll answer it. I'll do my best to answer it and give you my opinion. Um, so thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and bye for now.